I want to say just one or two more general things about sacramental theology, which are rather scattered thoughts, but I think important, and then home in on the two principal sacraments in order. First, picking up from where I was at the end of last time, talking about speech acts, that uh, sacraments are, as it were, um, the opposite of a speech act. A speech act is where you say something and saying it does it, where you say, I promise to do something, and you have actually created a new situation by saying, I promise. Uh, you've brought about something, not just thrown words out into the empty air. In the same way, there are certain actions which are like words, that they say something, they say more than the words can. And I instance, instanced a handshake or a kiss, where something actually is done physically which communicates all sorts of things that it would be quite hard to put into words. Actually, the most important things in life are routinely difficult to put into words. That's why we have poets and playwrights to, to explore and to help us probe the borders of language and make new connections and new metaphorical possibilities. Because if you have a wonderful experience, whatever it is, seeing a sunset, falling in love, hearing a symphony, um, you very quickly run out of adjectives to describe to somebody else what it was just happened. And, and that, is, that is how a great many things in life are, that we feel poverty-stricken with our words. But when we can actually do something which enables us with our bodies to say, this is what it's all about, then there is often something far more profound going on. And I think there's a danger in uh, post-Enlightenment rationalism still infecting us, and not least Western Protestant Christian traditions, um, infecting us to the point where we think that the reality is the intellectual formula which we can tie everything up in. And actually, in the New Testament, it works the other way. The word became flesh, and sacramental theology is all about discovering in fear and trembling how to allow that word to go on becoming flesh. And it's the same as the sequence of Luke 24. Um, your heart burning within you as the word catches fire within you and then knowing Christ in the action, in the breaking of the bread. And therefore, the speech act or the acted speech of sacraments actually prepare us for the tasks of the church in the world. I was at an ecumenical conference on the Eucharist recently in, in my home diocese, but we had Roman Catholic, Anglican, and Reformed speakers and participants there, which was a wonderful day. And we were trying to rethink the Eucharist in such a way as to show how the Eucharist energizes the church for mission. And the more we all went at it, the more it actually became very exciting. And I sense some of that excitement in this room today. Um, the sense that when you really understand the Eucharist as the gift which enables us to reappropriate the reality of those great past redemptive events, but also to anticipate in physical reality the redemptive events which are to come when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, then we have a shaping for and an energy for the mission of the church to go and feed the hungry and care for the lonely and house the homeless and so on and to work with prisoners and drug addicts and the unemployed and all of that. And I've seen that. One of the things I find very moving in my own diocese is to see the way in which people, without actually having an explicit theological framework, uh, people knowing in their bones that the road that takes them out of the church when they've just celebrated the Eucharist is the road that takes them out into the community where they must work for the people who are at most need. And it's the Mother Teresa thing where you meet Christ in the bread and the wine and thereby learn how to meet Christ in the face of the neighbor who needs you. The Matthew 25 principle of, uh, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison and visited you? Inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, you did, it, uh, you did it also to me. And there is a close fit, therefore, between that welcoming and recognition of the Christ who comes to us as f the one who fills heaven and earth and now mysteriously fills this bread and wine as then the Christ who comes to us in the face of those in need that we meet on the street or elsewhere. And my sense is that 
that, that the sacraments energize us for our work in the world in that all Christian work in the world is more than merely pragmatic. It isn't that we've learned the gospel in church and now here are some social problems which we're going to go and fix. Social problems are more intractable than that, as we should have discovered over the last couple of centuries. You know, there was a kind of enlightenment optimism that said that all we needed was better education and more democracy and better housing and drains and this and that. And then we would basically crack the problem of evil. And we've had the problem for some while now that um, the evil has been striking back. And because we thought we'd got it licked, we have reacted in immature and dangerous ways. I'm referring to the, the way that things have played out in world politics over the last few years. I've written about this in my book, Evil and the Justice of God. But the point that I'm making here is that all Christian work in the world is a spiritual battle. It isn't just a matter of the spiritual battle being in prayer for people's souls and then we just go and implement pragmatic policies to sort out their bodies later. No, the powers that rule the world are still powerful and need to be reminded of their defeat by Christ on the cross. And it is only as we are energized as baptized people and equipped as Eucharistic people that we are able then to go calmly and confidently into the arena of the struggle, whatever it may be, to campaign for justice in the world, to work for ecology and so on. And it's because we are, as it were, new exodus people through the sacramental life of the church that we are enabled to do those things. Not that that's to the exclusion of prayer and scripture, of course not. Because the second general point I was going to make was about word and sacrament. I could quite happily have talked to you all day about scripture and about a theology of the word and the preached word and so on. Um, don't think that because I was asked to speak about sacraments today, um, I actually only believe in sacraments. It's one of the golden rules of theology that you always have to say everything you believe because if you don't, somebody accuses you of deliberately missing something out somewhere. Um, <laughs> trouble is, there's always rather a lot to get in, as you observe. But um, the sacraments not only do not displace the word, but the higher a sacramental theology you have, the more you, of course, need a high theology of the word to balance it, if you like, to flesh it out. Because the precise point of the sacraments is that these are the moments when the story comes to life. If you simply took some water and without a word splashed it over someone, be they young or old, or if you simply without a word um, broke some bread and poured out some wine, there are all sorts of things that those actions could in principle mean. And from the very beginning, as with Luke 24, as with Acts 2, the word and the sacrament, the teaching and the meal, together with the prayer and the fellowship, go with one another, reinforce one another, energize one another. It is tragic that in so many Christian traditions over the last 400 years, there's been a polarization between word and sacrament. I know one or two churches in London that have become so anxious about the misuse of the sacraments that they've actually reordered their entire worship space so that the pulpit is all dominant and it's almost got to the point where they're like mosques where the word is the only thing that matters and the sacraments are kind of embarrassing things that happen off on the side somewhere without really um, uh, having any place, any focal point within the architectural or cultural scheme of things. And of course, likewise, there are many churches, and I have had experience of this as well, where the sacrament with a mumbled liturgy and uh, a minimum of preaching and explanation, the sacramental action seems to be the whole thing. And there are lots of people fussing around doing all kinds of things um, which really have very little word to give it life and direction. We need both, and those two traditions need one another, even though, of course, the more they go down their own roads, the more they tell stories about the wickedness of the other tradition in order to reinforce the extremity into which they feel themselves driven. We've got to have both, and if that sounds a typical Anglican thing to say, a both-and position, well, so be it. Um, 